think we're live. Well, my name is Evan Worthington. I'm a park ranger. That's, that's my official title. I cover the wild scenic rivers in the Oahis and the Oahe Canyonlands wilderness areas. Um, and I also uh, am a Leave No Trace uh, master educator, which means I know a lot of cool things about sleeping in the woods. So um, this, I want to introduce Ryan King. He's also a Leave No Trace trainer, and he is the owner of Bike Touring News, and he pretty much leads our Oahe Pedal Patrol packing uh, trips. Um, and in order to do those, you need to have some kind of Leave No Trace training and first aid PPR. So he's going to help me. We're going to plow through the uh, Leave No Trace principles and just hit on a couple points, but um, tonight Pam is uh, allowing us in a joint effort here to just really hammer in, dispose of waste properly, and that's where we'll deal mostly with the three Ps. So, you know, keep those questions in the back of your head and keep them coming. So, and don't be shy. Does anyone here not poop? <laughs> Okay, good, that's what I thought. We all have that in common right off the bat. Excellent, good deal. So just real briefly, Leave No Trace, um, the exact date I wanna say was in the 80s when they became kind of their own um, nonprofit organization. It kind of started with the Forest Service uh, with a few rangers just looking for ideas to come up with some principles, some rules, regulations to kind of keep areas that were getting hammered pretty heavily with use come up with an ethic that the uh, public could uh, grasp and use and spread the word on. Um, and so they decided on these seven principles, the first one being plan ahead and prepare. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Anytime you're going to go into a new area, you probably want to call, find out what the rules and regulations are about. You want to find out what the weather conditions are going to be like. Um, yeah, you want to prepare for anything. Um, and we're going to as we work through this, especially when we really get into the heart of the three Ps, we'll bounce back to that plan ahead and preparing because there's always some simple little things you can do to make your life easier when you're out there. Um, Ryan, are you gonna talk a little bit about traveling and camping on durable surfaces? Sure, yeah. Um, and, and again, it all kind of does tie back to plan ahead and prepare, but um, just planning your trip so that you're not forced to camp in a sensitive site, that kind of thing. Um, especially in alpine areas, um, fragile environments, desert environments. Um, so what's a, what's a good durable surface? Throw them out. Rock is a great one. Established trails obviously are a really great one. What else? Established tent sites. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah, if you can find, if you're in a place that's already seeing some use, like use a, use a campsite that's already been established rather than making that's a great, great way to do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think for most folks, that's a pretty, pretty straightforward one. Um, but the, it's surprising sometimes um, how folks kind of want to chart their own trail. I mean, you see it often, you know, in the foothills, especially and in open areas where there's not a lot of dense cover and you know, uh, undergrowth that keeps people on the trail. It's easy to kind of see your own path, but especially this time of year, um, that new vegetation that's coming up is super sensitive. And this is a really easy time to establish new trails you know, people are cutting corners and that kind of thing. So super important, even in the front country, but in the back country too. Um, and then dispose of waste properly, which is gonna be kind of our focus. Um, so Pam, you wanna take that one? Okay. Okay, yeah. Well, dispose of waste properly, we'll, that will, we're gonna get into the heart of it. That'll be the bulk of it. So we'll just kind of briefly move on and come back to that um, and take a look at leave what you find. That just essentially means um, what, it, what it states there, um, cultural sites, um, archeological sites. Um, is it okay you find that rock that's been carved into something? Is it okay to pick it up and check it out? Sure it is. Is it great to take it home with you and put it on your mantle? No, not at all. So um, leave what you find. Um, take photographs. Uh, do you really need to pick that plant or do you just need to photograph it? 
Um, so just be respectful, um, especially where I work in the Owyhees, there was never a treaty ratifying anything with the Shopai. They still consider that land theirs, and rightly so. And it is um, a sacred place to them. So be respectful. Leave what you find. Pictographs, things like that. Um, be mindful if you're taking photographs of that. That's kind of stuff that doesn't need to go on Instagram or the other, I call them S medias, um, or uh, have a GPS site to that location. And so, yeah, leave what you find. Minimize campfire impacts. That's probably one of the next to dispose of waste properly. That's probably one of my biggest ones that I deal with. Um, there seems to be a tendency that you're not camping unless you're staring into a campfire and you wake up the next day smelling like smoke. How many have a campfire when they go camping or insist on a campfire? When they oh, you guys are great. Well, good. Um, I personally um, find it, it hard to believe that you need a campfire, especially through July and August in Idaho. Um, it's awfully nice when that sun drops and it gets down to about 70 degrees. I don't really need that Paleolithic TV to stare into to figure out the world problems. Um, so have we used it for cooking in emergency? Sure, but we've kept those fires small. We've always packed out the ashes. Um, and there's several ways to minimize the impacts by using a fire pan. Make sure that you're just burning wood down to ash. And then also make sure that you're not burning trash and things like that in your fire. Respecting wildlife, um, you always want to do that from a distance. Um, this day and age where it's just great to get a selfie of anything, you, you know, you probably don't want that selfie on the Oahe of that rattlesnake. It just <laughs> is not going to go well for you. So um, view all that with a distance. Be respectful. You're, ac you're actually, you're in their home at the moment. So, um, yeah, anything you want to add to the wildlife? Ryan and I ran into some coyotes one time at a distance, and that was, that was pretty spectacular. Yeah. He had a great camera that was able to capture, but I hadn't seen probably a total of seven or eight checking yeah, us a, out. It was a big group. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I think that, um, again, like, Kind of, I'm kind of tying back to a lot of the front, front country things and some of the things that relating to people traveling by bike. Um, and so it's pretty it's pretty easy to sneak up on wildlife when you're traveling by bike because you're moving a lot faster than you are on foot, but you're still really quiet. Um, so it's a really, really good idea, especially if, you're, if you are really in the back country and you want to give those critters a little bit of a heads up, put a bell on your bike. Um, there's a, there's a handful of really great bells. There's a, a company that makes one that's called the Timber Bell. Um, shameless plug that we sell them at Bike Touring News. Um, I think they also sell them here at REI and lots of other shops in town. But it's a really, really useful bell for the trail because it, um, it rings passively when you turn it on. You just flip a switch on your handlebar to turn the bell on and then it just rings with the motion of the bike. And when you want it off, you flip the switch up and then it's quiet. So unlike a lot of the bear bells that you see out there that are basically just like Christmas jingle bell, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer coming through the woods, you don't have to listen to that the whole time if you don't want to. Um, so it's great for animals. It's great for, um, for shared trails, bike paths, you know, any place where there's other users on the trail, which is pretty much everywhere, um, unless you have your own private trail network someplace, in which case I wish you'd share. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that's a really, a really useful one, just to make a little bit of noise and, and give critters heads up so you don't startle them, especially in sensitive times of the year. Um, yeah, and then that, I think too, that one goes back to the plan ahead and prepare, um, because I, I get calls a lot about taking uh, pet dogs into some of these areas. And is that allowed? And, and what are the leash rules on things like that? So to, you know, to, to have your dog along in an area where you know there's going to be maybe, I don't know, a, a lek with the sage grouse going on, probably not a, probably not a good idea. It's probably time to uh, leave the pet in the car or at home. So again, that falls back into plan ahead and prepare um, with, as regards to respecting wildlife. And then the last one, uh, be considerate of other visitors. Um, yeah, I think the, the Probably the best thing you can do is just follow all those principles, and that will be probably the most considerate thing you can do for other visitors that are coming in behind you. One, they don't see what you've left behind. They get a similar experience of kind of peace and solitude that's 
out there. Um, this one too, they've added a few new things um, with electronics and things like that as phones get more advanced and GPS and things get more advanced as far as, um, uh, and maybe I'm just not of this generation, but I've had uh, a couple river patro patrol trips last season where I had younger groups coming down just kind of blasting music from their rafts as they floated by. and. Uh, yeah, I couldn't really, you know, I can't hear that canyon wren when Biggie's playing on the uh, speaker. So um, just be mindful and considerate that there's other folks out there looking for that same experience. Does all that make sense? Now is your crash course into the principles. And so I'm going to pass it to Pam now. Because, um, I just came off a patrol trip with the USGS where they gave me a wonderful head cold lead guide and uh, I wasn't able to blast through her new slides so I'm going to let her take the lead but we're going to now focus in on the three P's and dispose of waste properly and don't feel embarrassed about any kind of question when we get to this. Ryan's going to do some amazing examples for us. <laughs> um, so you guys know what is, right? yeah when we'll get we'll get to all kinds of uh, little things on the market and little tricks that can help you out. Any questions on those six principles? I know last time I was here, the be considerate to others, drones came up yes. and man, that was, folks were livid about drones. It was pretty <laughs> exciting. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's just, it falls under that category. You know, do you wanna be on a trail where there's drone following you? No, absolutely not. So you wanna take those things elsewhere not interfere with anyone else's experience. Questions, comments, theories, hypothesis, just lay them on. <laughs> We're going to open this up and try to get a good dialogue going for the next hour. So. Yeah, like I, we, there's a hike that we call Sky Island where you can kind of go up and see the confluence of the Bruno and sheep. And we came back and we were filling up our water jugs and all of a sudden we just heard Biggie Smalls. And we're like, what is this? And this kind of dis two disco boats came floating by and uh, the one in the back did shut off once they noticed we were out there. But, you know, it's kind of, um, yeah, that's an interesting phenomenon. I'm not sure. I, I like that music in the morning when I'm alone and getting ready for work. I just don't necessarily need it when I'm in an area of solitude. So. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks for bringing up. I was going to ask you about I heard some rumblings about them modifying the seven principles having to do with technology and technological courtesy and not posting everything you've done and everywhere you've been because we all do want to have a little bit of an exploratory experience sometime. There are a lot of people, it's really nice to be able to go out and find a little bit of information, but when you give it all away, uh, it's not quite as much fun. Yeah, yeah. I think if, you, if you've if you got friends across state lines and things like that, try just writing them a letter describing your experience and see if you can lure them in. I mean, we've kind of reached the day and age where um, if you don't take a photo of it, didn't happen for you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, try it. I did it last summer, wrote a letter to a buddy describing the Bruno Canyon. He hasn't made it out yet, but um, it's, a, it's a different experience. So, are we stuck? So to get started, um, actually, Evan, you could probably speak the best to this as well. Yeah, minimizing water contamination, minimize social and aesthetic impacts, um, minimize the spread of disease. That's another plan to prepare ahead. You know, put hygiene at the top of that list when you're starting your, um, your checklist of what you're going to take with you. Uh, maximize decomposition. Um, yeah, all this is, is just pretty straightforward. You, you, I think, um, has anyone ever read Paddling My Own Canoe? Um, it's about a, a 
woman that retired. She didn't have a lot of money. She was living in Hawaii, and she wanted to check, explore these other islands. She wound up swimming to some, and then, then later on she gets an inflatable kayak. But there's this uh, start of a paragraph in there where she has this water system to where she's doing, and granted, this is all pre-Leave No Trace stuff, but she kind of has a kitchen above, and then her cleaning area a little bit further, and then her bathing area down. But it doesn't talk about the fact that there could be another group a mile down that is suffering the consequences of all her great little kitchen, bathroom, bathing areas. Um, so when you're minimizing water contamination, the best thing to do is just to take that water from that source, get away as far as from you can, preferably 200 feet, then do what you need to do. Wash dishes, scrub up a little bit, um, and then broadcast your soap after you, sh uh, broadcast your, your water after you strain it. Um, does everyone understand the term broadcasting? It used to be we would dig a sump hole and just dump it all in there, but I think we've discovered that if you spread it out, it kind of minimizes the impact and can break down a little bit, uh, a lot more quickly. And then this is where you get into that conversation of what is truly biodegradable and what isn't. So look for some decent soaps that you know that are truly biodegradable and are not going to hang around for a long time. So, yeah. Um, the other thing about packing out waste, too, is that in certain uh, canyoneering areas now, they're going to require you to pack out your waste. So there's a couple options out there. She brought, is this a good time to show some of those? So this one is not, you know, your ideal backpacking toilet, but it works. Um, you can get your own little five gallon bucket in your own seat. Uh, so that's one option. Another option that we use that we recommend for some of our canyon trips is the wag bag. Um, this will be the cheapest bathroom remodel you'll ever have to do. So it's basically a bathroom in a bag. And this is the one that Ryan was going to demonstrate for us. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're going to do it together. Yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, we'll show you guys the little handheld method where you just kind of hold hands. No, just kidding. Um, but I'll just give a quick rundown on these. Um, when I... Uh, there's a tributary in the Deep Creek called Dick Shooter. Um, just a fantastic uh, canyon to hike in, especially in the fall when the temperatures are great. But it's an area where you just can't get 200 feet away from the water, so you need to pack out your waste. And this is what we used, but we carried a little four inch PVC uh, pipe with a cap on the end of it that's about yay big and it fits right under your backpack or on the side of your backpack and then you can deposit your waste packets into it and you don't have to worry about odors or critters or anything getting into it. But in these little uh, go anywhere toilet kits, you get uh, toilet paper, which everyone seems to always whine about and they're not accustomed to uh, military wiping techniques. <laughs> so <laughs> let me just give you a little example and we're gonna get deep into this guy. So ask <laughs> questions, don't be afraid. So in this little pouch is actually 24 wipes. I can see the eyes rolling right now. <laughs> so basically, what do you do? You wipe, and then you peel off the top one. And now you have 23 wipes left. <laughs> and this is how it goes. Now, I have two wonderful daughters that went through cloth diapers. And I'm a champ at milking <laughs> wipes. <laughs> so, um, so there's plenty. Plenty of paper there for you. Then you have, hopefully they still, yeah, they make these great American flag hand wipes. So <laughs> this is your patriotic duty to clean your hands when you're finished. So before you get started, you open this bag up. And this is your go-to bag. This is the target you're trying to hit. And they make it really big for you, okay? <laughs> so don't worry. You're not going to miss. Um, and then if you guys can see that, there's a little bit of this powder in here that's got a little enzyme. And what that does is it'll encapsulate it'll encapsulate the waste, and it'll also help with a bit of odor control, and it'll help break it down. 
So you're finished. Fantastic. I just went to the bathroom in a bag. This is awesome. I've used my 24 wipes. Boom, they go in there. I use my hand wipes. I close it up, get the air out. Then you can just seal this bag up with a nice little knot, and then they give you this little Ziploc. And you put that in there. And then this can go right in the trash. Now, if you were to bury this, you would come back in about four and a half months and everything would be gone except for the plastic on this Ziploc part. That's the only thing that they really haven't gotten down yet as far as degrading quickly. If you have to throw this in your pack like that, don't worry, it's not gonna degrade while you're on your hike. You'll have plenty of time to get to a trash can. So don't sweat that, but like I said, with that little PVC tube, we just wash them down in there and when we get back, they can go right into the landfill. And you're like, well, man, is that really sanitary? Yeah, think about this. By the time my daughters are, what, 57, some of the diapers that we've dumped in that landfill are still hanging out. That's pretty bizarro. And this will be gone in about four months. Crazy, huh? Question. Are you talking about both feet and poop or just poop on that? Now, that is a great question. Yeah. If. What was the question? Oh, for the microphone. The question yeah. was, are you talking about both pee and poop going into that bag? Yes. And the answer is, you can do both in this bag. Actually, you want to get a little bit of wet on that agent that's in there to help encapsulize that waste. So, but for river corridor camping or if you're in a canyon like that and you don't want the extra weight to carry out because sometimes you're going to be well hydrated and this thing could weigh damn near close to what a gallon weighs. <laughs> so you can pee a little bit on that and then in those cases you are, you can directly urinate into the river. And now sometimes folks get a little taken back by that, but essentially if let's just say this group here, we go on a river trip, right? And someone says, oh my gosh, this is a great pea bush. No one can see us. It's got plenty of privacy. It's got a great panoramic view. Um, and we all decide to go there. What's gonna happen to that bush when the next group comes in and the weather's about 105? You think there's gonna be a, an aroma there that they can stand to camp in that area? No, not at all. Nine, your urine is 95% water. So it's okay to dilute it into the stream. Now, again, with saying that, check your local protocols. They may want you to pack that out of there. Or they might have a different system because sometimes if there's not enough flow, let's say there's only a trickle in that stream, they'll say, okay, they may not even allow you to camp in that area because you can't, that's not enough water to dilute what's gonna go in there. Has anyone done a Grand Canyon trip? and they've done the Colorado River. Yep, right on. So you know pretty much they, when they check you in, they're like, yep, shampoo, soap, everything in, because typically you're dealing with over 12,000 CFS of water. And so it can handle it. Does that make sense? Question. How many, how many poops per wag bag on average? <laughs> okay. What's the record? <laughs> <laughs> the, the record for us was three. Yeah, but it's recommended just one. But since we're dirt bags, we milk it for everything it's worth. Um, so yeah, usually so one for one. Prepare, if you're in these places, yeah. how many wag bags are you gonna need? Yeah. Good to think about. Are you putting those wag bags directly into the PVC? So if you needed three total of those wag bags, you'd pack three and all three of them would go into the PVC that you're talking about? Yeah. We found when you're jamming into the PVC, we didn't use these bags because yeah. it's just too airtight. Mm -hmm. So we just put stuff in like that and just squished it on down. And do those come in like rolls like you'd get like dog poop baggies? No, they come, they come in, that's a great question. They can come in uh, two packs, okay. 30 packs, a box of 50. Okay. I think they come to about two, okay. 225 a bag, something like that. But my favorite thing about talking about this is like just being able to throw some to the audience. You know? so, 
take these home, have a good time, maybe run to a closet, try it out. You know. That's a good tip right there. Yeah. Try these out with, at home. Go, go to, say, hey, I'm going to be in the garage testing a wag bag, getting some privacy. Okay? So. So they also enjoy. have a, another version of the wag bag, but it's called a biffy bag. And the biffy bag oh. is, 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 is like the um, Cadillac version of a wag bag because it has, if the bag is, the inner bag is longer and the inner bag is actually attached to the inside. And so it creates this funnel, and at the top of the funnel, there's two pieces so that you can tie it around you and then bring it up the front, and you just go to the bathroom in your funnel. Whoa. And those are like three bucks a piece. Yeah. I'm sure you could get a deal on Amazon. But we'll talk some more about this, too, in just a minute. Um, so, yeah, and so, Evan, yeah, go ahead. Is the two usage of these based on the powder stuff in there? Or yeah. and, the, and there was <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, as, and the company protocol, and I actually met the guy at a symposium in Maine a few years back, and, and they do recommend just their one-use things. But if you want to stretch it, we were able to get it to three. Comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> Question. If you're not by water, can you pee on the ground or do you want it in a bag? You're going to check whatever the protocols are, but usually, yes, it's okay, urinate on the ground. And then now we're, that's going to lead into our discussion for cat holing. So that's where you're going to find um, where you don't. I, there's only one, uh, and I can't remember if it's in the Rocky Mountains where there's a trail that's so popular that now they do require you to carry out your waste, even though it's an area that you could cat hole in, but the use is so high that it just got to a point to where you couldn't dig a cat hole without hitting a cat hole. That's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Working in rag bags. Oh, oh man. We'll, we'll talk about this in a, uh, we'll, just a minute. Yeah. <laughs> To be continued. <laughs> so um, one thing to just, in all cases, keep it clean. And I love this little cartoon um, because uh, get your friends involved. Have them help you wash your hands. It's a little bit easier. You also don't want to be washing your hands in your water source. So grab some water, um, maybe a little bit of biodegradable soap. Uh, step away from your water source. Step away from your campsite. Step away from your trail and have your buddy help you wash your hands. And I, um, depending on what you're doing, you may even want to wash your hands before going to the bathroom, just to keep it all very clean. Hand sanitizer uh, before and after, it's good. So this is um, what you don't want to be seeing out there. If I have one message, pack out your toilet paper, just pack out your toilet paper. We don't want to see this. How many people have seen TP flowers? Yeah, everybody. It's pervasive, and it's getting worse. Every time I'm on the trail, almost every time I'm seeing something like this. And you may have thought you've done a good job of putting, making your cat hole, but there's a really good chance that it might get dug up, and then your TP is going to be all over anyways. So I just really, you know, if nothing else, please, please pack out your TP. Or on that, to consider alternative materials. If you're good at that, yeah, I am not it. good at so, that. Yeah. So one, one alternative material, which actually the guy that drew the little cartoon, he has a really good book of uh, like lightweight backpacking tips, I think it's called. Anyway, uh, River Rocks, exceptional. It, I'm, I'm not joking. So you, obviously you're not pooping by the river. Stop by the river, collect, you know, however many you need. You probably don't need the whole 24 pack like you get with the wag bag, but you know three, four, half up a dozen maybe. And uh, you know, it gets nice, nice little taper, nice texture. Give them a little rinse so they're not dirty and just carry them with you to your cat hole site. Works great. So then no, you have to bury your rocks too. Yeah, bury the rocks. Make a bigger cat hole so you can bury your rocks. Yep, no, no big deal. Um, plants are tempting, but plants are, are um, they're deceptive. Yeah, so if you know your plants, you can choose good plant material, but 
you know, again, in terms of not having, you know, having the, the smallest possible impact, you know, ripping nice big leaves off of plants isn't always the best idea. So anyway, plug for the river rocks as an alternative to toilet paper. And I'm going to you take your word for it's it. It's great. <laughs> and then you don't need the toilet paper. Then you don't have to worry about it. Good luck experimenting with alternative materials. Yeah. <laughs> Question. That's a really good tip. Do not burn your toilet paper. We also had an incident here in Boise in the foothills where somebody did something similar and it got called the poop fire because, well, we're pretty sure somebody started it by burning their toilet paper. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was not any of us. Right. Um, okay, so now you've seen this mishap. Ah, we didn't know what to do. You know, like, if you were really awesome at LNT, you might have some plastic gloves in your bag. Yeah. <laughs> you might pick that up. And you might tote a wag bag. That's for what those I was thinking that, is that so maybe we were ill prepared for coming yeah. along something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, um, you know, it was really upsetting to us because we were trying to mind all of our principles or yeah. Yeah. whatever. No, and that's when we do patrols and sometimes mm -hmm. we're out of smaller crafts, kayaks, we'll take two or three of these along just for cleanup. Not even for yourself, but I yeah, mean, for, yeah, for what yeah, you might we'll, come along. There are other smaller toilets on the market that will fit into your kayak that are reusable and you can clean them out in a normal RV dump. And so we'll throw in two or three of these just to pick up after folks. Okay. So that yeah. Yeah. I know, it's yeah. pervasive, yeah. Don, did you have a question? Um, a suggestion. So the mullein is great, but the leaves are very fuzzy, very nice, and it grows about that high by the end of summer. The nice, big, fuzzy leaves are not what they need. Yeah. Still a mullein. Okay. Alternative solution, mullein leaves, nice and fuzzy. But then you would have to wash that, right? Correct. So this is just one more thing you'd have to do out there. Yeah, then you're looking to go to another water source, get another two hundred feet away, scrub this thing out, broadcast that water. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 at the, I would probably just stick with the, with the wipes at that point. There, you know, with the last master's course I went on, and I didn't try this because I was just too nervous, but the instructor was doing, uh, uh, what do you call the toilets where you sit down and the water comes up and hits you? What is that? Bidet. He was doing a water bottle bidet. And he would, he would essentially take his water bottle and then do some Dr. B's or Don on his hands and just do a scrub up today type thing and then wash his hands and that was it and he do it at the water? no he would do it 200 feet yeah so he, he, he you have a designated water bottle preferably a squirt one and um, yeah and he swore by it but at that point I just had my second one and I had so many diapers that I wasn't gonna cover my hands in poop <laughs> <laughs> anymore. So I didn't try. Now I should have, but that's another option. Okay. All right. Well, we're about two slides in and about over halfway of our time. So oh, sorry. we better start moving along. <laughs> so um, I know there's a lot going on on this slide, but the take home point is what's the big deal? Research is showing, obviously, that by leaving our human waste, we're seeing an uptick in things like bacteria and protozoa and viruses. Anybody had Giardia before? Anybody? Anybody? Super unpleasant. Really unpleasant. I ended up in the hospital with Giardia in my early 20s. It wasn't fun. Um, 
I've heard myths that this maybe even sticks with you. Maybe that's a rumor. Um, and once you have GRD, you always have GRD. It might flare up again. I can't confirm that that's true. But basically, the other thing they found is, you know, if you're leaving your waste deposits on the surface, they may re that intestinal disease may remain intact for up to like eight weeks. So anything that comes in contact with that, there's a possibility. And so this, again, also has to do with like thinking about your TP. If your TP is just sitting out there, it still has species on it. It still has your stuff on it. So again, just take pack that out with you. Um, you want to just kind of eliminate as much threat of pollution and infection to other people as you possibly can. I know it takes time to make a good cat hole. Just plan for it. Um, make it just kind of one of these nice things you do. Go for a little nice nature hike. Find their perfect spot. So speaking about cat holes, so this illustrates kind of what you're looking for when you're going to be building the perfect cat hole. Again, you want to be 200 feet. So for an adult, count out 70 big steps. For your kid, maybe 100 big steps. You don't want to do anything like under a tree. You're looking for soils that are really rich, and it's going to help um, break down those materials. And you want to um, get a really nice shovel to take out there with you. And we'll show you some models here in a minute. And get it six to eight inches deep. Some, I'll even do it deeper and really get it down there. Because you're also wanting to kind of help mitigate things um, digging it up. And so get it down there kind of as far as you can. It is difficult sometimes to do good cat holes. But again, just plan for it. Spend the time doing it right. And then when you're done, I try and make it look like I wasn't there to a point. Um, you know, I don't want to be carving out a whole huge disturbed area when I'm doing a cat hole. But I also want, if somebody came across it, they might go, I might not dig right there. And for me, that's usually um, something that looks like a human would do it, like cross sticks or a stack of little rocks. I don't know if this works or not. I've never asked anybody if they found my cat holes. <laughs> But I, I leave some indication that I'm like, hmm, I might not put a cat hole right there because there's three stacks of rocks right there. I don't know if it works or not. but <laughs> um, So this illustrates also, again, the, the perfect uh, mix you need to be digging a cat hole. And I actually really like um, that he does this. So they're saying save a plug. And so if you have a, a shovel with a really sharp edge, you can take um, like the grass layer off and have a plug and take that and put it off to the side. Dig out your dirt in a little pile right next to it. Do your business. Line it up in your hole here. Have a stick. It is always good to stir things around. So stir your stuff without your toilet paper with a stick down in there. Cover it back up with your soil. Put on your plug. Put down your X, your stack of rocks. You're done. So if you're interested in um, positions, there's lots of options. Um, I am a classic squatter. This is the best for me. I feel like I go the best in the classic squat. But there are lots of options. You can either do uh, one hand back just to have a little bit more stability. Um, I don't think I could even do the telemark if I tried. <laughs> you, might, you might mess up on that one. It could get dirty. Steve Learning Curve. Uh, okay. You like the telemark? No, I <laughs> um, sometimes if I can find a nice rock to lean up against. I've heard some ladies who like to hold on to a tree and go. Um, get creative. N uh, nook between like some branches on a big log. I don't know. You can probably come up with many ways. Um, and then again, I'm going to say it one more time. Pack out your toilet paper. It's just really, it's everywhere. If you don't want to see it, don't be a part of the problem. Pack it out. Um, so group latrines, the only time I've ever experienced a group lat latrine is actually on an ITA um, maintenance trip. And different people do this differently. But I was on a trip with, I think there was like a dozen of us. And we found a really great spot that we thought would uh, decompose well. And it was a big, long trench. It was a trench maybe five chairs long and pretty deep. I mean, a couple of us were in there with big shovels, putting it down pretty deep, taking up all of the soil, all of the stuff. 
laying it out in front of it, and then everybody went to the bathroom there. And so when somebody went, they'd go in the trench, and then they'd take the shovel, and they'd put just a little bit of, they'd cover up what they just did, but they wouldn't bury it, just cover it up. And so then the next person would come, do their business, just cover it up a little bit. And so the point is that you're getting all in kind of this one spot. And again, like if you want to be stirring it around, but leave enough room that before you leave, you can put in a good chunk of soil and then come back, cover that all up and let nature do its business. And again, packing out your toilet paper. But that's the only time. Do you guys use group latrines at all or have any comments about those? Do you have any thoughts about them in general as far as sanctioning? If they, you know, if you're going to have a, a pack animal bringing in stuff, then it's just easy enough for them to bring in like a riverbank toilet that's, that's good, good for up to 45 uses and you can haul in extra uh, containers for them and then you can just take all that stuff out of there. Gotcha. I've never been in a situation where we've done a latrine or anything like that. So okay. even with the the Leave No Trace <coughs> Master's course, there was 15 of us, but we dispersed different areas to do yeah. cat holing, so. And I'm wondering, so on this specific trip, we were in a little river corridor, a creek corridor, and I'm wondering because of the lack of like good options close to where we were camping if they didn't do the latrine, I guess I never really asked. Yeah, but. no, and, that, and that's, that could be the case. Mm -hmm. I just haven't been in that situation, but I'm, sh I'm sure what they're doing was acceptable. Yeah. So. I hope so. I wasn't in charge, so I'm like, this seems like the right thing to do. <laughs> okay, so um, I like to put together something called a TP toolkit uh, for when you're backpacking. Basic pieces, uh, get your big, large Ziploc bag that you put all of your other things in and uh, bring some TP. I like to use wet wipes. Some would consider this a luxury. I say it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. Um, sandwich baggies, so what, everyone has their different method for how they want to handle their TP. I take like the little fold over sandwich baggies, I put my TP in there, and then I tie it off, and I put that in another Ziploc bag. And so all of my TP is in this little plastic capsule, and then I put that all in one Ziploc bag, and I carry it around with all my other stuff, my hand sanitizer and my shovel. Um, I've heard some people who like to use things like um, dog poo bags. I think they're supposed to have some sort of barrier to help with smell. I have heard of people doing things like wrapping it in tinfoil. This supposedly is supposed to help with the smell. Or duct tape to at least help strengthen the bag that you're carrying all this stuff. Adding things like coffee grounds or loose tea to help with smell. There's all sorts. You could probably just put some like potpourri. I don't know. <laughs> like you could get creative with your TP kit, but it's not as gross as you would think. You know, if if you're if you're conscious about how you're using your TP, um, it's easy enough to stay clean and still pack it out. So, and and we touched on some of this before. Wag bag waste alleviation and gelling. I also had no idea what that meant before this presentation. I guess the gelling part is the stuff in the bottom. Yeah, and we talked about the uh, go anywhere toilet. So we have some options over here, and when the presentation's done, you can come take a look. But like this big bucket, or like for car camping, this also is for a bucket, but it has a little seat. Um, yeah, wag bags, go anywhere toilets. So those are options. Doggy poop bags. Oh, and the other thing that's really cool, um, they have these odor-proof bags. So you could also use this for putting your TP and stuff in. So this is a reusable. They're really thick um, and, and heavy duty, so you're not gonna like bust through them. I've actually only ever used this. I put it inside my food bag, because they have different sizes. But I'm like, hmm, maybe you could use that for your TP as well. Okay. Okay, good to know. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to say about pooing before we start talking about peeing? Or any other questions about pooing? Good for now. Yeah, go ahead. So using all that, the plastic bags that you were talking about makes me kind of nervous using all that plastic and wasting that. Right. Um, are there cleaning options? Sure, yeah. And like they were talking about with the... Yeah, like Like I said, the only thing talking with the manufacturer is that there's, is 
zip on this is what's going to hang out for a while in the landfill. Yeah, and I, I wonder if these, and it's not saying right on here, but there's also these masket uh, baggies. I'm sure if you Googled biodegradable baggies, you would definitely find something. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, and it's all about trade-offs, you know, it's like trade-offs. You do want to keep it out there, you want to get it out in the way that you're comfortable getting it out. Um, okay, so moving on to peeing, again, just kind of talking about why is it important to think about where you're peeing. And we also, as humans, carry around a lot of things because we put a lot of things in our bodies, and I'm not just talking about bacteria and protozoa. Now we're also talking about hormones. We're talking about medications, pharmaceuticals. My good friend here will tell you all about the trickle down of the things we put in our body and how that runs through our ecosystem. Because now you're not only affecting each other, you're affecting nature, you're affecting animals, bugs, what they eat, everything like that. So really think about it. So if you're you know, putting something like that into a water source and if everybody's doing that, that's gonna have an effect. And they are seeing a rise of these things in the water, not to the point where they're like, whoa, 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 nobody pee in the back country but to the point that it's like, okay, this is a little bit alarming, just, you know, this is where education is so key. So just be conscious about, it. like, go before you go. When you get to the trailhead and you think you might have to go, go. Go in the place where it's good to go. If you feel like you kind of have to pee, go. Go before it's an emergency so you can put some thought into it. And, um, you know, just kind of put, think about where you're going. Pharmaceuticals, we're all taking medications for something and some of that just washes right through us you guys have anything to say about contamination peeing best practices you do not need a cat hole for peeing necessarily but again keep that 200 feet away from camping trails water sources and these guys know much better than me how to handle it in water situations it sounds like Going in the river is the thing to do unless told otherwise. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, the other thing that I would add to this about getting 200 feet away is go ahead and um, get a funnel and get a pee jug at night because inevitably, especially I just came off a river trip where it was 20 at night and the cold response is you're going to pee. And so it's a drag to get up and run down to the water source to go pee when it's 20 degrees. Um, so designate a bottle. They've got plenty of great um, uh, female funnels too on the market that work great and uh, have a pee jug. And you know, talking about being in small canyons uh, in Utah and in Idaho, carry that jug out and when you get to an area where you can broadcast it away from water, then you empty it. That is pretty much that easy. So find a good pee jug mm -hmm. and label it. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to confuse the pee jug <laughs> with your Gatorade. <laughs> yeah, and again, pack it out. Use the TP, pack it out. So some tips for the ladies. We all, you know, it's so much easier to pee when you're a dude. You can stand up and do it and just pee and be done with it. Um, when you're a lady, you have some more things to think about. One of the things is you gotta take your pants off, so you need to have a little bit more privacy. You can't just be like, I'm gonna go pee. I'm peeing. <laughs> you gotta take your pants off. So you gotta think about where your, th your spot is. And then you also, um, something I see commonly, especially among like long distance hiking community, is the peeker chief. So they'll basically take uh, a handkerchief and designate that as their wiper. And um, they go, they wipe, and then they just put it on the back of their backpack to dry. Uh, this is really common, but I, I haven't brought myself to do it just yet. Um, there is some thought that the UV rays from the sun will help dry it and sanitize it. Um, some tips and tricks for the peaker chief is like, put a knot at the top of one end, so that's like your handle part. You never touch the part that you actually are wiping with. Of course, you can always wash it out every couple of days, but as you can imagine, if you peed and you peed on it, 
it's probably going to smell like pee a little bit. So trade-offs with the pee kerchief. Um, is your target area clear? I don't know how many times I've peed on my pants or my shoes because I was in a hurry. And if you just don't want to smell like pee, make sure your target is clear. Don't pee on your underwear. That's also happened. <laughs> and like everyone was talking about, the pee bottle, ladies, embrace it. It is the best thing ever. Um, if you don't want to get up and go outside, especially when it's cold and dark, uh, they have some very wide mouth versions of like even collapsible bags that's pretty easy target to hit even a little bigger than a Nalgene bottle. They also have many, many devices to help ladies pee. Even if you want to pee, stand up. You can do that if you want to. Um, so here is just a slide. These are some that REI sells here. And we can kind of pass some of these around. So this one is the Freshette. Pass that thing around. And basically, you know, you just hold it over your lady bits and you pee. Um, also, this is one of those things where don't do it if you really have to go because that funnel can only hold so much at, the, at a time. And if you don't want to overflow that thing, you have to have some control over what's coming out of you. Um, try it at home where if you have a little oopsie the first couple of times, you're in the shower and you can just wipe it off. But um, I, I used this for a stint when I was down working on the ice, and it was like the best thing ever because you're like, I don't have to get out of my tent right now. <laughs> you get out of your bag. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> get out of your bag. You don't want to have any accidents on the sleeping bag. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you can see there's all sorts of devices, and if you're really into looking for the best of device. There are many, many resources on lines and opinions that will tell you which one they like the best. Um, honestly, this uh, talk was somewhat inspired after I went on a ladies trip last year and someone brought something called a shiwi and we talked about it multiple times. And so I'm like, this is a thing that people are doing. I think other people should know about it, that this is a possibility. So if you're uncomfortable going to the bathroom in the woods and a little device will help you make that easier, all the better. Do you guys have anything you want to say about peeing in the woods as a girl? <laughs> you know, I have two daughters, but they're doing great. Now you know the options, yeah. just in case, yeah. just in case. Uh, I will say this too, for the river community, those funnels, especially for um, women in dry suits that don't have the correct zipper, they really are just a lifesaver, for sure, because if you don't, have that funnel and you don't have a back zip, then you're taking that thing off. And if you're taking it off in the cold and in the rain, you're just, you're gonna get everything wet that you're gonna seal back up in that dry suit. So the funnel is, I last year finally got, if you volunteer with me on the river program, you get your own funnel. It's yours for life, so. Nice. Yeah, yeah, that's great, and that's a good point too. If you're just in a situation where you know you're not going to have a lot of privacy, having having a little device like this is a good idea. Yeah. If you wanted to hook the shiwi tube to a tunnel and put it down your pant leg, you could probably do that. Um, like, you mean take the tube and then, like, run it out your pant leg to someplace else? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so you just be out there kind of like this? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> that is so hilarious. I wish I could get what I'm doing right now for the video because that's, like, the greatest idea, to just be standing out there with your leg out to the side and, like, I'm just peeing right now. Um, you could probably get as creative as you want to with this. Yeah, <laughs> Whatever so makes it. Try it at home. Right. Yeah, try it's it at home. How is she doing that? Yeah. You should talk to this guy. He sounds like he knows how to make that happen. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. What I have done in Minnesota, but peeing in a pee bottle can actually save your life if you're cold. Yeah. Sure. Because it's 98 degrees coming out of your body. Right. And yeah. It's a price you fit. It can go at the bottom of your sleeping bag and keep you warm for a little 
Right. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. So, so just had a comment from the audience that um, if you're winter camping and you have a pee bottle, this could actually save your life because your pee is warm and it could help keep you warm. Um, so bringing up the winter camping, that should probably be something that we touch on. What do you do if you have to pee? Not so much peeing. What, if you have, what do you do if you have to poop and everything is covered in snow? Any ideas? Pack it out. That's a great thing. That's that. That's a good alternative. Any other any other um, tidbits? Has anyone experienced this? Well, I was in Alaska. What did you do? Alaska, thirty below. Thirty Not below. Okay. And I'm with the scout troop. And I'm the only girl. I'm the mama of the scoutmaster. <laughs> I had to go find a. They had a little outhouse thing. But even inside that little. Sure. Because you have to get undressed, a girl. And I had all these layers on. It took me for like 15, 20 minutes to mm -hmm. undress and dress again. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the pee thingy would have done a really wonderful thing. Yeah, like a like one of the wag bags or something. Oh, I'm thinking of the tube. Oh, the tube. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to take your pants off. Madonna, did you want to? I'm not telling. <laughs> well, that's not fair. <laughs> okay, Evan. If I did the normal cat hole thing and packed out my paper. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't, you're, you're not going to get through the frozen ground, so yeah. you just do what you do normally, but in the snow. Yeah. And then yeah. And, and there are some chances that um, if you find a tree well, those spots stay kind of warm. You might find some unfrozen ground in a tree well, but those can also be dangerous. So don't go like climbing into a tree, a five foot tree well just so you can go to the bathroom. It's not worth it. Um, so yeah, I mean that one you're just gonna have to use your judgment. Um, yeah. All right, so last topic, how to deal with menstruation. Um, and, and really I do think that this is a topic both men and women should know because men, we all, you have daughters and friends and grandkids and nieces and you know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. Um, it's a fact of life that this happens. So, uh, how many people have seen Anchorman, the movie Anchorman? <laughs> wow, only one, gosh. I thought I was so clever putting this in here <laughs> because this guy is talking about, um, he read somewhere that bears can smell your periods. They smell the menstruation. They're going to come for you. Is this fact or fiction? Who believes that this is a fact? Bears are attracted to menstruation. Just you? Okay. Sure. Anybody think that this is just a bunch of malarkey? Okay. We're going to go with malarkey. Um, so yes, your menstruation is scented. So you treat it like, like anything else that you would consider a waste. Um, but they aren't technically attracted to it more than anything else. And so this has been kind of debunked. And interestingly, this is something I learned for the presentation, this started in the 60s when two women in Glacier National Park were attacked and killed, one of them was menstruating and one of them had tampons, so they were for sure that's why they got attacked and killed. This was the night of the grizzly that was here. Okay. Yeah. So for the longest time, and you can find these this really cool pamphlet online, um, they were telling people that if you are menstruating to not be outside and be oh. camping, because <laughs> uh, the bears are attracted to you. And, and to, to, I mean, to, to be fair, they will be attracted to you because it is, you know, usually something a little bit smelly, but it's not anything more than anything else. It's not like the bear's like, I can smell this woman menstruating five miles away. That is not going to happen. <laughs> So hopefully um, there are ways to mitigate for that, but just some best practices if you just happen to be in the backcountry. Um, even if you're just doing a day hike, it can be a little bit of a pain. You have to think about it a little bit more. Uh, first thing, do not bury or try and burn feminine products. Um, pack it out. Uh, try and keep it as clean as possible. Again, hand sanitizer before and after 
This is also something I learned, the surgical glove technique. So what you do is you buy a box of those latex gloves or non-latex if you're allergic, whatever. Put one on, do your business, and then um, when you're having to like pull one out, you can also put one on and pull it out and then just wrap the glove around your feminine product and tie that up and get rid of it. Again, this is more plastic um, having to, that you'll be putting away, but you know, trade-offs for health and personal hygiene and just like the whole ick factor of dealing with something out there like that. Um, another option I've seen on the trail are menstrual cups. And I have an example here of what that is. So they sell these here at REI. This one's called the Diva Cup. And it is a cup. And you put this up inside of you and it has a little drain that you plug. And then you... You basically just menstruate into this cup, and every so often you dump this out and clean it. I would not want to deal with this out there, but I've seen many people who do. And basically, you would then treat this like um, you would have to dig a cat hole or carry that fluid out with you. You wouldn't just put it on the surface like pee. So that's one more thing you'd have to think about. And then you have to clean this sucker. Boiling water. You would have to have good boiling water to clean this. And again, you know, have to get away from your camp and everything else to clean something like this out. I have met ladies who also use um, sea sponges, and they'll use those and then clean them and wash them out there. Um, I've seen uh, women who are using, like, reusable underwear products or menstrual pads, but again, like, having to clean it out there. Just think about that stuff. I personally treat it like any other time and just try and do it as clean as possible and pack it out, but there are lots of options. Um, other options, if you're on birth control, skip it all together. This is my favorite option. Cycle through your hormones so that you just don't have your period while you're out there. Then you don't have to deal with it at all. Um, if you have questions about that and you don't know what I'm talking about, feel free to ask me. Tampons, of course, the menstrual cups. Again, test this out before you get out there. Uh, you don't want to be dealing with how to use that efficiently when you're in the backcountry. It's not the best place to learn how to use an alternative method for dealing with your period. Sea sponges, reusable pads, and those sorts of things. Um, and again, like you can, you can deal with uh, feminine products like you do with toilet paper. There are some specialized products for carrying those out and helping with scent. But I would think the same rules apply as with toilet paper. If you want to add some tea leaves or if you want to put it in like an odor proof bag. Most of us are not out there for so long that it's going to get so bad just like any other garbage. Um, it's, it's just not that, that big of a deal. Um, you guys have anything you want to say on or have any experiences with? Jesse, you got a question or a comment? I was on a um, canyon trip in Utah, and you, we were using wag bags because it was a small canyon. And I was also on my period, so the wag bag was an excellent yeah. uh, spot for the poop and all of the waste Feminine from products. the right. tampons. Yeah. So it was a nice little pouch, and I, I think I packed quite a few into each bag and it had the absorbing powder and also odor control and stuff. So yeah, it was idea. pretty convenient since I was already having to pack that out anyway. So I just used it as a storage container. And I wonder if you can just like get that stuff that's in the bag. Yeah, I'm not, I haven't really looked for it, but that's a like the gelling, deodorizing powders. Yeah. Um, That'd be interesting to find yeah, out. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yep, waste management. So there is actually a gal online, and I have some resources at the end here, um, that does make a biodegradable biofilm that you put your products in, and you put your product in, you strip this thing off, fold it over, and it's all sealed up. Um, she sells these cute little kits to help you with your lady time while you're in the backcountry. Sam Spiggies, again, using like uh, something like the gloves or a wipe to help with application. Um, all sorts of options as far as, uh, you know, kind of odor management, just like we kind of talked about before. So, again, just a page here to um, give some more resources for the ladies. Sorry I don't have a guy resource page, 
but this just seems so, you know, this is more specific than <laughs> some of the pooing stuff. Um, so throughout this presentation, I've showed some really funny little cartoons, mostly in the pooing section. And this is this, it's from this awesome book called Alan and Mike's really cool backpacking book. It is hilarious. So if you're just wanting to like learn how to respectfully be out in the backcountry, backpacking, best practices, and get a good laugh at the same time, this book is amazing. <laughs> do we have any questions or do you guys have anything you want to add on? For any of the topics? No, I mean, just remember this all to just go back to that plan and prepare ahead. Um, you know, like trying to kill spontaneity. You know, if you get off work on Friday and you're like, woohoo, we're going camping, but just remember how crazy things can get if you're just not prepared for it. And that's usually when trips go awry, is when you've forgotten something from your list or um, yeah, you just didn't really think about it, get through thoroughly. So that's that would be my take home. Anything you'd like to add, Ryan? No, I think that yeah, that's pretty well covered. Okay, question? Could you go back to the resource page? I'll just pick it up. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, and I will if you if you either want to get the slide deck from me or something. If you put your name and email on the sign up sheet in the back. I will send you links to everything. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, so I think that's about it. And, and for the Trailmaster series, I have one presentation left. I'm uh, gonna be talking about how to lighten your load. So if you are into backpacking and you wanna be carrying a lighter pack, this is a presentation for you. I'm actually doing two sessions, one at, I think, five and one at seven. Um, so end of next month, uh, lots of great tips and tricks for how to do that. And with that, if you guys have any more questions or comments. Oh, and if you want to come up and look at any of the um, kind of gadgets and products, and something I forgot to mention, there are different versions of shovels. My absolute favorite is called the Deuce. They're kind of expensive because they're titanium, but they're super light. And this is five times more efficient than the plastic one. You can pick out rocks. You make a cat hole like a master with these things. They're amazing. It's changed my life. So <laughs> get the deuce. And please come up and take a look. All of these products are available here at REI. And if you do buy something, get a token and put it in the ITA bucket. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I, do, I did bring some LNT swag. If you're interested, there's some uh, LNT 